about the presenters. We have Danielle Carlock. She founded the Maricopa Native Seat Library in 2020 in Phoenix, Arizona in the United States. She's a librarian at South Mountain Community College in Phoenix, Arizona in the US. And she has been gardening in the Low Sonoran Desert for about 12 years. Uh, she's a former biology teacher and active in the Arizona Native Plant Society. And Shawnita Anwuma, myself, Love, loves libraries, and I am employed at the San Luis Obispo County Public Libraries in California, along the Central Coast uh, in USA. And I uh, have managed the seat library in Santa Margarita since 2019. All right, so now we have uh, an overview of this presentation. So this is what we'll cover. We'll cover the importance of native plants, Habitat at Home, and how seat libraries can help. And then we'll have examples of implementation with the Maricopa Native Seat Library and the County of San Luis Obispo Public Libraries. You'll also see how you can start a Native Seat Library or a Native Seat Collection in your existing seat library. So now I will turn it over to Danielle. We'll start there. Thanks. Um, in this uh segment, we're going to talk about um, native plants, what they are, and why they're important. Um, so just kind of getting into sort of the definition of a native plant. So native plants are plants that have evolved locally over a long period of time and are intrinsic to a specific ecosystem that they're a part. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to include native plants in a seed library. We'll be talking about this extensively. And so having some of this background, depending on your knowledge of native plants, people have a wide range of knowledge and familiarity of them. So I want to kind of get us all on the same page about that. Um, so some of the reasons you might include native plants in a seed library is because of these relationships that have evolved over very long periods of time between native plants and all of the wildlife, the whole ecosystem that they're a part. Um, native plants promote the integrity of local ecosystems and they promote native plant conservation. And we'll get into that a little more. And you can see a picture on the slide of an amazing um, succulent that's a native plant to the Sonoran Desert where I live and work. So native seed libraries help promote this concept of habitat at home. And this is, I think, becoming more and more of a recognized paradigm and people are actively working in these areas um, all around the world. And the idea is, is that really our wildlands, they are so fragmented, you know, mainly through development. And they're also threatened by wildfire, um, overdevelopment, drought, invasive species, and then climate change acting as a threat multiplier to all of those um, all of those factors. So really, I think the paradigm is changing where we're saying, you know, what we put in the places where we live, our gardens, our balconies, our patios, our, our front yards, those things really matter to wildlife all around us. And I, Doug Tallamy is a great thinker on this topic, if you're not familiar with him, to Google him. Um, he's been writing a lot and talking a lot on this topic. And he's basically saying, you know, habitat at home is really a more expansive way to think about gardening, you know, historically, Folks have gardened, you know, what they put in their yards has been for, you know, for food or for aesthetic purposes. Um, what plants look beautiful in our yards and those weren't always necessarily native plants. And so the idea here is instead, let's start thinking about what are our, you know, what are the plants that are growing here where we live, but maybe outside of our home areas. Like for example, here in Maricopa County, as we developed all these tracts of homes, the areas were bladed of their native plants and are devoid of that. And so you have to go out on the hiking trails to see what's native to here and you're not seeing it in our home landscapes. So um, this is what we're talking about is this idea of habitat at home. And so um, native seed libraries can support these ideas um, and these, these practices. So habitat at home can be small. You don't have to have a lot of space to create habitat at home. Um, you can create that in a, a small balcony with potted plants even. Um, but I personally believe, and through the work I've been doing, that habitat at home is one of the most impactful things that a person as an individual can do in their own sphere of influence to help the environment, to support pollinators, um, to honor the earth, and to prepare and continue to adapt for climate change. So we'll talk a little bit more about um, these concepts, but I really want to kind of um, get everyone thinking about how habitat at home is good for you, it's good for your family and your community and for wildlife as well. 
So I'm going to go through kind of five different um, points to ponder about native plants and uh, why they're important and why habitat at home may be important. And some of these may resonate more than others, depending on where you're coming from, your background. But I think these are good to kind of get us all on the same page. And then if you're thinking about starting a native seed library, these are the kind of you know, um, concepts and ideas you might promote if you're doing education around, um, around these plants and why people may want to garden with them. Because I'm finding that you know, a lot of people are not familiar with native plants and they say, well, what does it matter whether it's native, it grows here or something like that. So these are some of the um, reasons that I'm going to get into ecological, economic, health, uh, moral and spiritual considerations and aesthetics and a sense of place. So native plants are really um, essential components of healthy ecosystems. They have relationships with the microorganisms in their ecosystem, the insects, the birds and mammals, and the people in those ecosystems. And so because of these long periods of time of these interrelationships and um, the development or the evolution of this, these ecosystems, in general, native plants will support wildlife better than non-natives. That does not mean that there aren't some non-natives that will support wildlife in your particular area, but research does show that the native plants that have evolved with those native pollinators and that native wildlife, because they're really, they're almost like a, they're a whole when you think about ecosystems as a, its own, like a living, breathing entity in and of itself. And even people talk about, you know, the Gaia hypothesis, the entire earth as a a living eco, a living you know entity in and of itself. So that sort of idea. Um, also, another ecological reason is that native plants provide a wide range of what they call free ecosystem services to the community. Many native plants are edible. They provide food. They provide shade, especially in a warming climate. They help purify water and they help. Um, regulate floods. They also control erosion. So there's a lot of benefits to um, from an ecological uh, point of view. Now getting into the economics, um, the native plants of a region, whatever the, that assemblage of native plants are, and those are going to be different to different regions, they are adapted to the climatic conditions in that area. So in general, they're going to save money on uh, different things such as water, yard maintenance or fertilizers and pesticides compared to, let's say, a lawn or um, at some other non-native landscape because these native plants are, like I said, are adapted to those conditions. Um, so that's sort of from the homeowner perspective or the, you know, the landowner perspective that saves money. You could also argue that each of our um, unique ecosystems worldwide, um, they draw tourism, they draw tourism dollars. And the more you preserve um, that, you know, that beauty of that ecosystem, the more you're contributing to the the economic value of that area. And so on the slide, I have a picture on the top of an invasive plant called stinknet, which um, is invading areas of Arizona. And then a picture below it of natural Sonoran desert habitat. And people don't come here for stinknet. They come here for our natural Sonoran desert habitat to appreciate it and enjoy it. Um, stinknet is very, um, it creates um, allergic reactions in people. It smells terrible. And um, it's not something that, you know, is going to promote um, that it's an invasive plant. It's not native. So from the perspective of health, there are health reasons to encourage and support uh, native plants. And one of the primary ones is that our native plants really don't require pesticides or fertilizers. Um, so there's less toxins going into the environment, less, less toxins going into our bodies. Um, also, when you think about what I call this living landscape of native plants, as you're supporting native plants and, and wildlife in your own home space, whatever that space looks like, there's lots of benefits to nature when you step right outside your door. And that um, there's research behind these benefits, lowering blood pressure, reducing stress, improving mood, and boosting the immune system are just a few of these benefits. So these are all reasons why you'd want to include native plants, as well as many, many of our native plants have medicinal value. In fact, there's a lot of native plants that haven't been fully explored in terms of their medicinal value. So the more we can preserve these and conserve these plants, the more we're able to um, you know, protect these ecosystems and, and then also protect um, the med potential medicinal values in the future. 
So there are also moral, moral excuse me, and spiritual considerations related to um, native plants. And so we can argue from a philosophical viewpoint that native plants have intrinsic value, that they have a right to exist in and of themselves and should be conserved. So from sort of that philosophical argument, there's also a spiritual argument, I believe, as well, no matter where you look spiritually um, and spiritual traditions around the world um, in both space and time, no matter what those traditions are, they teach us the value of nature and interconnectedness. So I believe there's spiritual arguments for supporting native plants and habitat at home as well. Not to mention that once you create a native garden, and this is a picture of uh, a garden I previously created and owned, um, that it's so beautiful. It's a wonderful place to engage in spiritual practices, whether that's meditation or prayer or any other spiritual practice. So I think there are or also moral and spiritual considerations as well. And then finally, the idea of aesthetics and a sense of place. When you think about native plants, um, I personally believe they have aesthetic beauty. They're beautiful uh, in how they look, but they're also functionally beautiful. Their beauty is in what they do as well. They serve pollinators, they serve wildlife, they provide food. So they have functional and aesthetic beauty. And many of them provide year round color, interest, and of course, attract wildlife. So I think there's an aesthetic argument for native plants, as well as this idea of a sense of place. Like I was saying, each ecosystem has its own assemblage of native plants and native wildlife. And so together, um, this beauty and you know, this sense of place, you know, people, for example, come to the Sonoran Desert to see our Sonoran Desert. They don't come to see you know, non-native plants that are from you know, Eurasia or somewhere like that. They're coming to appreciate what we have here. So this is just kind of laying the groundwork, but we're gonna talk about as we talk about how to implement a native seed library or add natives into a seed library. We wanted everyone to kind of have a little bit of a background on some of the arguments for including native plants and for habitat um, at home. So I think now um, we're gonna pause for questions that have come in the chat. So the main, the only question that I've seen so far is that someone wanted you to define local for native plants. Ah, so <laughs> yes. that's, that's up to interpretation. That's definitely up to interpretation. And that would be a question that probably ecologists, you know, are throwing around all the time. How I've defined this for myself in, for the Maricopa Native Seed Library, we're a countywide effort. So I've defined native plants as native to Maricopa County. And I've also included what I call bioregionally native, a few species that are plants that are maybe outside of Maricopa County, but are bioregionally native. They might be native to the Chihuahuan Desert, other parts of the Sonoran Desert or the Mojave Desert, but they provide some particular value here um, to wildlife or to, you know, they might have some particular benefit. Um, for example, um, there's something called Greg's Mistflower that's actually a Texas native and I've included it in our seed library because it supports queen butterflies in our area. Um, and it's not invasive, although it's not technically native. So there's a lot of discussion about what do you mean by native, but locally would be, I'm, I'm defining it as within my, my county, understanding that those borders are artificial. I also kind of stick within an elevation gradient. So I'm staying under you know, a 3000 feet in elevation plants generally that are adapted to that and, and locally or bioregionally native. So there's another question, how can we find a list of native plants for each of the individual yes. areas? And I was just going to say, I'll put a link to Calscape. So for people from California, Calscape is a great resource because you can type in your zip code and it tells you what plants are native to your area and it tells you what nurseries carry them. Um, and if there's other, and I think Xerces, I'll also put a link to Xerces because they have mm -hmm. some links to native plants um, across, around the country. Um, do you want to add anything to that, Danielle? Yeah, I mean, that's a big point of the upcoming parts of the presentation. So okay. we're getting into that in our implementation and nitty gritty. Right. This was more just kind of that broad sweep because I don't know that um, folks are familiar with native plants and all the arguments for including them. You know, right. since most seed libraries are focused on food plants and food sovereignty, which is very important, but there's this other sort of piece and this is providing, you know, a, what we might call landscape plants, you know. So the plants I'm talking about are primarily trees, shrubs, um, what they call su subshrubs, um, grasses, um, in our area, cacti and succulents. So those sort of things. Um, and then another question, how is climate change affecting native plants? Mm. 
I don't know that I'm qualified to give a broad answer on that. Um, I can, I can't really, I can't really answer that. I can only answer it in terms of how I'm trying to prepare for it personally, myself and my own garden, but I don't think I can really answer that more globally. And then someone says, have you considered the cultural importance of native plants? For example, um, here, I don't know how to pronounce this, Aquasasni Mohawks are known for basket weaving of black ash tree, but it's under attack by invasive species, the emerald ash borer. So that's basically considered the cultural importance of native plants. Yeah, so there's all there's ethnobotanical uses, you know, or, or uses for so many of the plants. I mean, I'm I'm just thinking specifically the plants I'm familiar with in my county, and so I've done done a lot of research on ethnobotanical uses, and I've also invited the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, on which is um, Scottsdale Community College, where I founded the seed library, is actually on on their land and I've invited them to engage with me and and on um, including what they feel appropriate to share if it's you know about these plants and so there's been some conversations about providing the names of the plants in Othman Piposh languages and and other information as they feel comfortable sharing so this is very much a dialogue you know especially because I'm non-native so so I think you're going to get to some of these other questions about the seeds, whether they're grown in nursery or collected from the wild or home gardens. Yep. You're going to cover that later, probably. Mm -hmm. yep. um, OK, so I think that's probably it for now. OK, are we ready to move to the next slide? I'll just go ahead and introduce this next section. So in the next section, we're gonna be talking about um, how seed libraries can support this endeavor of native plants. And so we believe that seed libraries are really an ideal avenue to increase the availability of native plants in the community. Um, and these are some of the reasons. Um, our libraries are accessible, open to the public. There's no cost barrier. The seeds are given out for free. Um, and you know, libraries have historically always been um, promoters of values such as access, equity, sustainability, and lifelong learning. So it's really an ideal um, location or venue to get the idea, get, get native seeds out, get the word out about native seeds, and provide that education. And so now Shonita is going to talk about how they've been doing that at County of Slow Public Libraries. Thank you, Danielle. So um, if you missed it at the beginning, I am Shawnita, and I manage the Santa Margarita Library in San Luis Obispo County in California. So uh, I'll give an overview of how we um, handle our seat libraries. So eight of our 14 libraries have seat libraries, and each branch will designate a seat librarian to oversee the care and feeding of the seat library. Um, They'll choose which seeds go into the collection based on climate and popularity. And so each seat library is unique to the community. Um, our first permanent seat library began in 2016 at the Nipomo Library, and it started as a cooperative uh, pilot project, project with the San Luis Obispo Seed Exchange and the library. And clearly it's spread to, to other ones now. So. Our seed librarians are responsible for repackaging and labeling seeds for patrons to check out. Um, and then we re report statistics and we organize educational programs through the library. Um, and yes, some patrons do bring in seeds from their gardens to add back into the seed library, but it doesn't happen at all places. Uh, our next slide will show our eight different um, seed library locations and we have quite a diverse climate throughout the county. Our county is covered, our county covers over 3,000 square miles and about 100 miles of coastline. And the numbers and letters you see there are the planting zones for each area. And as you can imagine, we have quite a, a variety of climates. And I pulled one example from July of last year. Um, our bottom right, our Shandon Seat Library location, the uh, temperature for that summer in July, one day was 97 degrees, while along the coast in Morro Bay, it was only 65 degrees. And so we have uh, a big variance of uh, 
of temperature around the county. So while we do and can share seats among all eight locations, we do try to pay attention to the climate and the popularity as was mentioned before. Our larger libraries do offer a larger selection of seats um, due to the amount of space and the time that goes into preparing and maintaining the seat library. But all of us maintain a budget for materials, for seats and for programs. So if we go to our next slide, we will see um, just some pictures of some programs and other things that uh, our seat libraries have, have offered. So the seats themselves, we do select non-GMO and preferably organic seats. And some of the partners we have are the San Luis Obispo Botanical Gardens. Our Morro Bay Library has partnered with them for uh, seed exchange. We also purchase seeds through um, Seed Savers Exchange and Everwild. And of course, we host seed exchanges at some of our locations. Um, we rely on the local seed saver groups as well as patrons who have gardening expertise. And um, our county, our county public works department has provided a standard seed mix for the county. And these, um, the seed mix incorporates native, fast growing and drought tolerant annual grasses and flowers such as lupin, California poppies. And these ones are formulated to include low height vegetation with low fire risk, which we appreciate. And this uh, standard seed mix that was provided by the county is great for people like me who are beginners because the instructions just say, rake the soil, scatter the seeds and enjoy. And as far as programs, there's, there have been a variety of programs offered by our different seat libraries, and I'll just list some of them. Uh, one was Basics for Saving Your Seeds, and our Royal Grande location had a teen green workshop, which they were able to use um, a bee feed flower mix to get their seeds started. Um, of course, local experts from nurseries come to the libraries and give presentations as well. And some locations have offered a grab and go bag. And that means that everything you need to get your seat started is located in the bag and you just pick it up at the library for free and take it home. And there are two pictures on the bottom of this slide that show uh, fourth and fifth graders who helped plant milkweed and other native plants at our Nopomo um, seat library location. And one nice program we also have is called Discover and Go. And that program allows anybody um, that holds a library card to reserve a pass once a year to the local botanical gardens, as well as the botanical gardens at Berkeley. And I think I saw some people from Berkeley here. Um, so these programs uh, kind of connect us to the community and help us learn about seeds and uh, native seeds as well. And even this morning, I think three of our seat libraries hosted uh, seed exchanges in person, as well as um, educational programs about seed libraries and native plants. So uh, we're always happy to learn from each other. Some of our seed librarians have uh, expertise in native plants. Some of us do not, like myself, but um, we're happy to learn from the community and even get suggestions from uh, patrons who come in. And thank you for allowing us to share what we do here in San Luis Obispo County along the Central Coast. And now I will hand it back over to Danielle. So I started the Maricopa Native Seed Library two years ago as a sabbatical project. I'm a library faculty at the community colleges and I was a, I'm a, a avid native plant gardener. So I already had some knowledge about the plants from gardening and trying to obtain some of these native plants. And so I wanted to make them more widely available. So I'm gonna go through um, how I went about launching the Maricopa Native Seed Library and then get into some more nitty gritty about how you can do something similar where you are. I'm gonna talk about what's involved in planning and preparation, how to obtain and process seed, any other elements you might wanna add besides actual seed distribution, and then um, encourage you with some of the groundswell that I've experienced in terms of interest in these types of plants. So the first thing I needed to do was to figure out, well, what native plants are in the region, kind of like some of the questions people were asking earlier. And I knew quite a bit of them, and I thought I knew quite a bit of them until I really started digging in and, you know, kind of learning more, going to a lot of workshops, uh, educating myself, and going out on the hiking trails and um, identifying plants with iNaturalist and finding out what else was out there. And I realized that 
what I knew and what was out there, there's so much more and I'm still learning every day. There's so many plants, I will never know them all. But figuring out what are those native plants was kind of my first step. And I'm gonna talk more about how to actually do that uh, in a later slide for your area. So that's gonna be the first thing. And that's one of the hardest parts, right? Of the whole thing is kind of getting that piece sorted out. Um, also, you wanna think, well, because there's gonna be so many native plants to choose from, what are going to be my inclusion criteria? What am I going to focus on? And so the, what I cho chose to focus on was I wanted to make sure that the plants I included in the seed library had a high wildlife value because I was really interested in supporting this concept of native uh, you know, habitat at home. Also, because I figured, you know, it's going to be hard to ask people to grow, you know, sh shrubs and trees from seed that um, I wanted to focus on ones that weren't already commercially available. So there was going to be, you know, a need to say, well, I can't get it commercially. I can't buy it as a, as a plant. So let me start it from seed. And then because I'm in the Sonoran Desert and I'm concerned about climate change, I was looking for plants that were on the driest, the most xeric or driest, you know, the ones that could tolerate the most dry conditions and the ones that could tolerate the most heat. Because um, there is a range, even in Sonoran Desert native plants, and then, of course, because I wanted people to have good experiences with germination, and germination is very different with native plants that are um, wild plants as opposed to what we've cultivated. Um, they are not as easy to grow from seed as your lettuce, your veg you know, your different vegetables, even tepary beans. They're not as easy to grow from seed because they haven't been bred to germinate quickly. So I was looking still for which ones out of this range were the easier to grow from seed, or if they if they were easy if they weren't that easy, what instructions could I give people on how to get them to germinate? So those were the criteria I created. What might be you know relevant in your area will be different, but I just wanted to give you some of my thought process. And so I wanted you know I'm. I work in the community college setting. The education piece was really important to me. I developed plant profiles for each of the plants and there'll be an example on the next slide so people could learn. And then also each of the packets has information um, as far as what I knew about the plant. You know, how large will it get? When will it bloom? What, what, um, what specific even butterflies or moths is it a host to and things like that. And then develop the, the website, the social media, and then we set up distribution. We're currently at five community college libraries. And so this is an example of a plant profile for New Mexico thistle, which is native to the Sonoran Desert of Arizona, even though it's, it's also native to New Mexico. And so it's just an example of a plant profile. So when somebody takes a packet of New Mexico thistle, there's a tiny URL that brings them to this webpage where they can get more information. And I really tried to focus on how do you get it to germinate and what is the wildlife value, especially for some of these plants that people would never have considered putting in their yard. Because some people think, oh, thistle, oh, that's a terrible plant. And meanwhile, thistle is an amazing nectar plant for butterflies, even monarchs. Um, so, and it also is a host plant for some butterflies. So it's pretty, pretty important plant. Um, so that's an example of a plant profile. Now, the obtaining and processing seed is definitely the most challenging part, and we'll get into how you might do that um, in your area. So how I approached it was, well, there's no way for, nowhere for me to get these seeds. They're, they're not out there really commercially. There's nowhere for me to really buy a lot of these seeds. I have to actually go get them myself. And since I'm a hiker and, and interested in this, is, and it was a sabbatical project, I began by getting the proper permits to collect on the Tonto National Forest, which is a, in, Mar in uh, Maricopa County and adjacent counties. It's a large national forest um, to be able to collect. And then also our campus, I was lucky to have a campus that had a lot of natives already. So I was collecting there and my home garden. And I did take some donations from local gardeners, but it was only when I could really be um, sure of what I was getting. Um, but there's quite a bit of that to tap into the community as well. Um, seed processing and storage. I had to learn all the techniques um, for processing um, because I didn't have equipment. You know, we're not a seed company. You know, we don't we don't have all that fancy equipment and personnel to process seed down to it being you know this beautiful processed seed. And in fact, a lot of research is showing it may not be actually in the best interest of you or the plants to process it too heavily um, because the more it's processed, the easier ants are big predators of seeds. They take seed away. And um, the more you process them, the more you may lose them to seed predation. So I've actually been doing a little bit less processing as I've gone through. As long as the 
and the advice I got when I talked to experts about this is to process them to the level that they're recognizable as seed, um, but they don't have to be perfectly cleaned like you might get from a packet you buy from a seed company. So as far as seed packaging, it was really important to use a paper instead of plastic because of the um, mold issues and things that could happen in plastic. And also um, had to think about you know, storage of seeds and all these sorts of things as well. Um, and I mentioned because I'm working at a community college, the education piece is super important to me and the including students in the project and outreach to the community. So after the seed library launched, I started working on a habitat certification program for Maricopa County and adjacent areas that are in the same elevation. Um, and basically, so this is a whole educational effort where I'm doing workshops and uh, put out uh, guidelines from a panel of experts to how to create um, pollinator uh, habitat which ties into the seed library so people can get seeds and, and develop pollinator habitat. Um, like I said, there's workshops on plant palettes. I've been collaborating with a lot of different organizations and particularly outreaching to Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. They have gifted us with some plants. They also allowed me to participate in plantings um, on their land and just uh, many amazing things have come out of the project. Uh, we also have some demonstration gardens at some of the colleges where people can come and see a lot of these native plants and learn about them. And I've been focusing on the piece with, um, you know, getting students involved, interns, curricular connections, service learning, and things like that as well. And this is really just a slide to encourage you um, about including native seeds, because I, I really thought when I started it, I said, oh, you know, who's going to come get these seeds? You know, people, are they really going to want to grow these shrubs and trees and grasses from seed? And, you know, are they really just really looking for lettuce and, and food plants? Are they really going to want these? And I've been shocked at how much attention has gotten for it. We've given out over 12,000 seed packets. Um, TV stations, news outlets were approaching me, uh, wanting me to talk about you know, the project, get the word out. A lot of organizations are always reaching out. And so the point here is just to say that there was an unmet need for seed in, in my area. And I'm wondering if there might be that same unmet seed, I suspect, in your areas as well, because this is, a, this is not something that's been um, you know, really promoted in a, bi a big part of our culture. And I think we're realizing more and more how much we need to honor and value um, native plants locally. So now this is the part where we get into the real nitty gritty of how you might do this in your own um, situation. So like I said, these are kind of the steps you'll need to do. Um, you'll need to think about what native plants are local to your area. Um, and figure out which ones, because it's going to be you know, hundreds and hundreds, are going to be what you'd call the target species, the ones you're going to try to include in your seed library. Um, what type of informational materials are you going to provide and in what formats and languages? Um, how are you going to actually get the seeds and how are you going to process and package them? And of course, we're not getting into all the other parts of things that have to do with uh, running a seed library. Um, there's lots of other workshops and content on that, but really about specifically to native seeds. So here are some of my thoughts on how you could do this. Learning about native plants in your region. It's gonna be really important. There's a lot of different websites. These are listed here, and I think they're gonna be going into the chat. Um, most of these are United States centric, but I did include some that were more, more worldwide. And these are sources where you can learn about the native plants that are specific to your area. Um, but I think that it's going to be that in conjunction with finding your people. You want to find your community of experts. I believe that in every community, there is an ex a, a bunch of people that have knowledge about this that you can tap into. These might be people working in um, nonprofit organizations or in higher education or even in government. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, you're going to want to decide about your informational materials. Uh, what type of information are you going to provide and in what format? I think that if you can provide germination information, how to get the seed started, that's going to be really good for people to know so that they're not kind of in the dark about that. Because again, native plants are harder to germinate in general compared to our cultivated crops. Um, you might want to think about providing wildlife value information and what are their growing requirements and what time to sow them if it's known. In some cases, it's a little bit unsure. Um, people always ask these certain questions of the Maricopa Native Seed Library. So these are things to be ready for. What plants are going to be easy to grow? People always want to know that. They want to know what can be grown in containers. So always, I always have at the ready 
three or four or five species to recommend to people when they ask about, oh, what can I grow in pots? So I always have those ready. And then people ask about bees a lot. And this is a great opportunity for education because a lot of people, when they think bees, they think honeybees, which are not native. They're Eurasian and they are not really um, what I am trying to support in my um, my work. They are supported secondarily uh, because the same plants that provide nectar and pollen to native bees are also supplying honeybees as well. But the idea of diffusing some of the fear around bees um, that people do have in their gardening, um, of course, everyone that's allergic has to be, you know, uh, you know, taking the proper precautions, but in general, kind of diffusing a lot of that overall uh, fear. And then also being mindful of letting people know, because some seeds and plants are poisonous. And so letting people know that and having that prominently displayed in your information, I think is important. Um, so making a plan for obtaining seeds, this will be the hardest part of including native plants or starting a native seed library. And it's going to go back to that finding your people, find your peeps. Who are they in your local community? They may be people from your local native plant society. They may be from a botanical garden or arboretum or a garden club. They might be from a local environmental organization or a higher education institution in your area or government agencies. Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Forest Service, um, like Tony to mention, County Public Works or other local agencies, tribal agencies could all be uh, possible places to tap into local expertise as far as how you might obtain seeds and maybe be able to partner with them. If you are going to collect your own seeds on um, public lands, there is a permitting process that's involved. So you want to make sure that you obtain the right permits and of course, if you're working in private land, then there's permissions and things like that. And then there's also a protocol for collecting seeds ethically from the wild. And this is something is really important because at the same time that like the, the seed library, we're trying to get people growing these plants in their home landscapes. We wanna make sure we're leaving enough seed on the forest and in these other places for the plants to continue to reproduce there as well. So there is guidelines, it's called the SOS protocol. That's a United States protocol for ethically collecting seeds. The Center for Plant Conservation also has information along those lines. So that's gonna be a really important piece. Um, of course, recruiting gardeners to donate from their gardens if they have seed that you're looking for that, um, it could be another option. You may be able to find seed companies that will offer donations. I personally haven't found many that offer um, seeds that are local to my county, that are native seeds to Maricopa County. It seemed like the prairies of the Midwest had some of the best seed sources commercially of getting prairie, um, you know, native pl prairie plants, but I did not find uh, many for mine. So I really did find that I had to collect them. Um, processing and packaging seeds. So you're going to have to decide, and I alluded to it earlier, how much processing should I really do? Um, some seed doesn't require any processing. As it comes off the plant, it's pretty much available as seed, and you just need to dry it. Um, other seed is much more intensive with processing, but you'll have to decide how far am I going to go with that in terms of how much people power do I have to do that, and it may not even be desirable. And this is where consulting with your local experts, like folks at your botanical garden, or if you have botany faculty members and folks like that could be uh, really good sources about deciding what to do. And in fact, if you can partner with them, so if you're a seed library and you can partner with these organizations to do the collecting, to obtain the seed, to process the seed, um, so and also volunteers or possibly staff time, that's kind of a win-win um, because I think everyone has an interest in getting more of these seeds out. Um, you're going to need a system for creating, um, create a system for organizing and labeling your seed. Um, you definitely want to store in paper and not plastic, and you want to think about storing in um, glass longer term or airtight containers um, in refrigerators. Um, some of the processing, processing will have to out occur outside, especially like milkweed, you know, it's very messy. So those are some things to think about. And there are lots of different techniques and you can Google some of them, but um, some of it will be discovery. But I think it all goes back to finding those people that are the experts in your area to collaborate with. Um, so just some further advice and encouragement. Um, the, um, the seed library that I run, we have about 35 or 40 native plants in our seed library, trees, shrubs, grasses, um, a variety of different things, but you can start slow. Choose a few really high value natives that are easy to obtain and process in your area, even if it's only five species, 
that will go a long way. Um, and just keep growing your partnerships, find those people and know that it's a valuable contribution. And I really believe that if you build a native seed library, they will come, people will come and use it. And then, and then wildlife will use the plants. So, you know, so that's sort of um, that chain, right? If you build the seed library, people will take the seeds and then wildlife will benefit from it. So I think that's kind of the end of the, um, our official content. I'm gonna advance the slide. Thank you, Danielle. That was wonderful. Um, so we have a few announcements before we get to the question and answer. So um, we have this one. Sorry, let me move my thing so I can see it. So join the One Million Seed Savers Campaign. This is a collaborative grassroots project working towards uh, getting one million new seed savers. And there will be a link, I think, dropped in the chat from Robin. So you'll get access to that. And then our next slide. There we go. Um, we have a survey that we would like for you to fill out. Um, we would appreciate your feedback. So High Moen Seeds and the Great American Seed Up are offering seed packets to randomly selected participants as an acknowledgement for your love of seeds and as a thank you for doing the survey. And we will contact you if you are one of the recipients. I must say, due to legal restrictions, only continental U.S. people uh, can receive seeds, but we do appreciate all of your feedback. So please, uh, if you would click on that link for the survey and take that, we would appreciate it. And I think we have one more announcement for you, the seats of Vandana Shiva. So this uh, documentary documentary will be streaming uh, up until the 14th of February. And if you would click the link that will be provided in the chat, you can sign up and uh, watch this film and it is a $10 fee. So if you would like to watch it, uh, the link we made available for you. And I think that is the end of our announcements. And now we will have Q&A unless Danielle, you have something else to share. No, I think I'm gonna go, go ahead and stop sharing the screen so I can okay. see the chat and see everybody um, since I haven't <laughs> been able to do that prior to this time. So I'm gonna go ahead and I guess we'll open it up to questions. I think we have um, we have time for questions. Yep. So, um, people definitely type questions into the chat. Um, there aren't really any questions from the earlier chat, but there is one question. Do ecotypes factor into your collecting for the seed library? So I'm trying to collect seed that is locally, the local ecotypes. I'm trying to collect seed that is directly from this, this region. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Well, I guess, yeah, eco, depending on what the definition of ecotypes is. Right. Are there any other questions? Okay, Elizabeth, what's your question? Uh, let's see, does your seed library stay open year round? Do you try to put seeds out at the approximate time of year they should be planted? Mm -hmm. or just include that information on the packaging? Um, so at the Maricopa Native Seed Library, we do stay open year round, but we go into like what I call a semi-dorbency in the summer because it's not the best time to sow a lot of our seeds necessarily. Um, I'm not sure about slow, Shawnita. Yes, we do have seeds year round and we try to have them available based on uh, the season. Um, but of course, each location may have a lull um, to when they have seats available. But we, because we're open to the public year round, we do have them available. And then another question, can you talk more about your field experience and the advice for people gathering seeds of a specific species? Um, hmm. So it's really going to depend so much on um, your area. So for my field experience, I've had to try to learn, you know, the best times for seed collecting, which generally here is, I would say, April through, well, there's kind of a big April, May, June, depends on the species in July. And then again, there's another flush of certain things in the fall. 
Um, so it's really getting the timing right. Um, I do bring out uh, people sometimes to collect with me and I have to make sure they have, you know, all the safety things in place, you know, as far as, you know, do they have sunscreen and water and, you know, all those sorts of closed toed shoes. So along those lines, I'm not sure what else you might want to know about field experience. So follow up in the chat if I miss something. Um, let's see. So do you solicit feedback from the seed library patrons? And if you do, how do you handle that and communicate with your patrons? So I can say for the Maricopa Native Seed Library, we, um, we don't know who's taking seeds because it's all in the honor system. So getting feedback, I do get some feedback from social media and I'm about to launch a survey to try to understand if what, what people's experiences are with germination um, so we could better target the education piece. And for us in San Luis Obispo County, we do get feedback from patrons, I think, all the time. And for each location, um, they can decide how they handle uh, the feedback. Sometimes it's a request for more programs or a certain type of program. So we try to uh, implement what we can. And or they may have suggestions for seeds or native or um, locations where we can get more seeds. So we absolutely uh, take that feedback and try to implement it. So here's another question at your library. Do you have many herbal edible varieties? And I guess that's within the native plant world. Presumably. Mm. So there's a, um, there's actually a chia that is native to the Sonoran Desert. And, but it's hard to get in the seed library because it only, um, there's not really, it's a very, rainfall dependent and it blooms only once a year they're very small um and so it's hard to get them in but that that one is edible and there's a few other edibles some of the trees the pods the palo verdes those are all edibles so another question is it preferable to store seeds in paper packets inside or perhaps in a shed or garage so i guess it's kind of inside or a protected outside area <sighs> um there's a, I can't think of it right now. There's some um, law that, that somebody that did germination experiments about like how germination rates, uh, the, hot, the hotter it gets, the worse the germination rates are. So I think it was, and once you get into the 80 degrees Fahrenheit, a lot of that dropped off, it seemed with the, at least that research. So I try to keep my seeds um, refrigerated or, but I don't think there's a lot of research on this for native plants. Like if, if they can, if they don't have to go, it, it, there's, there's so much uh, conversation about this. I don't think there's been enough um, actual controlled experiments. And here's another one, um, Danielle, the 12,000 packs you distributed, are that, is that through the life of the program or in a single year? The life of the program when we started in fall 2020. Yeah, okay. And then did you collect them all or were some purchased and donated? I think you sort of covered that, but maybe you should repeat that. Most of those were collected, but we also had donations of food plants because I was trying to kind of bring people in with, you know, traditional like um, lettuce and tomatoes and all that. So I was offering some of that in the beginning and now we're scaling that back. So some of the 12,000 would have been more typical food, you know, food plants that seed libraries offer. And here's another uh, interesting comment. So this person volunteered for the National Park Service and their rule for gathering protocols was uh, never to collect more than a third of the seed in a given area. So that seems like a good um, guideline. Yeah, the BLM SOS protocol calls for no more than 20% of the available seed from a plant or as a whole, what you're seeing. So somebody else has best temperature to store seeds. I think you sort of covered that. And then the air they said, do you store in airtight containers? It sounds like you don't, or you do? I do. First they, go, first, they go into paper bags to get collected. Then they spend some time drying off and on like those aluminum, you know, uh, cooking pan things. And then they're processed. And then they go into glass jars in the refrigerator. Uh, let's see. Have you had a time when looking? I don't understand this question. Oh, just, I guess if you're looking for a specific species, how do you locate it if you didn't know where it was? I use iNaturalist to try find, um, mm -hmm. find populations. And this has been, you know, an ongoing thing. And I've had all sorts of uh, adventures in this. I've had like places where 
uh, I was actually going back for a wild crop relative of tepary beans that I had seen in a riparian area on the Tonto and they were there. And I went back, I waited a few weeks and went back hoping to collect seed and the whole thing had been trampled and eaten by cattle. Um, so I've lost, I also lost um, seed due to wildfire. I went, there was an area on the Tonto that I was collecting, collected, and then that area burned um, two summers ago. So now I have seed from an area that's burned and it's going out to the community. So there's been all sorts of um, things like that. Also things like um, having to look more when we had the really dry year, like two years ago, not finding certain things in bloom at all. And they couldn't be in the seed library. It's just availability. And then that's a teachable moment to people. Well, and there's also the interaction between seeds and fire in California. A lot of seeds need fire in order to germinate. They don't Correct. actually come, they don't come up until there's fire. Let's see. Um, yeah. Do clean orange tinted plastic medicine bottles work for storage? Mm. Well, for longer, longer term storage. So I relied on the California Botanic Garden to, I'm also starting a seed bank and they sent me directions for seed banking. And that was, there were plastic sealed bottles that they recommended I used. I think it was uh, something, I can't remember the, the name of it. And then those go into a freezer for longer term seed banking. But I've been using glass for, for, for the shorter term, like the seeds that are going to go out in the next year, I've been putting them in glass in the refrigerator. So here's a question. Um, we've been looking for a way to run a virtual seed library that is non-commercial, but allows you to recover shipping costs. Is there even such a thing? <laughs> I, yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, historically like seed libraries, I think they generally give their seed out for free. So maybe you're talking about a little bit more of a creative, creative model. Yeah, I know during the pandemic, our seed library would take orders kind of somehow virtually and then they would just put them out as if they were a library book but they would put them out for the patron but that's not quite what they're talking about um let's see i don't see any more questions i was just gonna um piggyback on what diana was saying about sea storage being cool dry and dark yes yeah yeah that's definitely um, the three things. And so I was just trying to also, because we're in this, in a hot climate, I was trying to also keep mine co cooler through refrigeration, especially in the summertime here. And I just want to remind everybody that this session is being recorded and um, it will be available to you after. You can listen to the whole um, session afterwards if you came in late. And it says the Seed Library of Los Angeles did mail seeds during the pandemic and asked for donation for mailing. So that's that's cool. So I guess that's it. Question. I don't see any more questions. Well, there was somebody said starting a farm or nursery of native plants is a good idea just to ensure seeds for the future question mark yes yep yeah yeah i don't see anything else that we haven't really covered okay oh let's see there's no messages uh do you find donations from others a reliable way to build up this collection or do you need grants to purchase? And you've kind of already covered that, but maybe you could say it again. Sure. Um, I have taken donations from reliable uh, people. I know gardeners that I can verify what the seeds are, um, but there's no grants for obtaining the seeds because there's really nowhere, there's no source to buy bulk native plants that are Sonoran desert plants. In California, there are some um, places to buy bulk seed because a lot of farmers plant hedgerows, native plant hedgerows. And so mm -hmm. in sort of the greater Bay area, there's hedgerow farms and a couple of places where you can buy seed in bulk, but it's probably mm -hmm. not, it's going to be, you know, certain varieties or certain species. It's not going to be any all native plants. Okay. Seems like, let's see. Um, it's very hard to remind people to collect seed even when it's their own garden. <laughs> then um, are you engaged in seed rematriation projects in your area? Um, curious what the local indigenous populations may be trying to recover and if your library has those seeds. 
so I spoke with the um, on Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. There's a community garden um, there, and the director of that, I, I um, asked him, you know, what plants would he like to see in the seed library, and he gave me a list of ones that were important that would be nice if I could collect when I'm out on the Tonto and other places to supply to the seed library, but we're not really engaged in rematriation because as I understand that, that's traditional food plants and that's not really um, the focus of the seed library per se. Although there's overlap because there's native shrubs and trees and things are also some of them are traditional foods. Um, I know in various places in California, there is real land rematriation and a lot of the indigenous People are, you know, starting uh, gardens to grow some of their traditional mm -hmm. plants. Yeah, and there was a talk on that earlier that so the recording will be available. So somebody says, I run a tribal native plant nursery. We appreciate the donations. That was McKay Burley. Do you have a link to the um, McKay to your site um, or yeah, the name of it so we can learn more? To the chat, yeah. Yeah, in the chat. <clears throat> for seeds in a package um i've been going i was going with 25 i don't know about you guys uh shawnita what do you guys do it varies but just enough to get started mm -hmm. yeah it sort of depends what kind of a seed it is if it's annual wildflowers i put sort of a teaspoon um, I, cause I prepackage everything, especially during the pandemic, cause they didn't want people to have to be rummaging around. So I prepackage like a teaspoon of wildflower seeds. Cause those are annuals, the perennials, which, you know, will grow into bigger bushes and stuff. I do maybe 10 or something. And it's two o'clock. So time to wind things up. Oh, well, thank you everybody for attending and for your questions and uh, thank you to Danielle too for allowing us to participate and for our chat moderator Robin thank you yes thank you everyone greatly appreciated <laughs>